Good evening, everybody. It's very nice to be able to see you for another episode of One Peter. Uh, we, we're really trying to kind of work hard because we've got a Christmas deadline. Um, and I'd love to be able to finish One Peter uh, by the end of the month so that we can do uh, a, a series that connects with Christmas, uh, with celebrating uh, Jesus' coming down to earth. So I'm just going to set myself up here. And hopefully you can see me uh, well on your screen. Let me just adjust my own screen. And there we are. So, 1 Peter. It's been a fantastic time. It's been a bit of a journey, okay, uh, doing this. Uh, but imagine, okay, as we continue in our 1 Peter series, that one of the big uh, advertisements on your, whatever you put, whether you purchase stuff from Amazon or wherever you get your news feed, one of the things that comes up there is this. An awesome implant that can uh, go right in your temple here or of a person uh, that you love. And that means everything that they see, you can have a direct visual feed on your tablet. Okay, imagine that for a second. So wherever they go, you can see what they see. But not only that, folks, if you get this thing, okay, here's what you also get, a chemical chart on your device that tells you how that person is feeling. So, you know, uh, if uh, little Mary sees a Johnny and her, um, I don't know, endorphins go up, you go, hmm, I know that my daughter is really in love with that boy, feels something. You know, you could know what's going on. Now, imagine that we've got one of those in your little head. Someone is going to follow you throughout the lockdown period, seeing what you see. How would you feel about that? Would that excite you that other people can share in your life? Or would that more likely terrify you? Now, I think it would terrify most of us. And that's why we don't like the idea of a reality show, even though most reality shows are actually probably scripted anyway. But for me, if you were following me around, probably you would see me around the garage, um, trying to make stuff uh, that probably doesn't work very well, reading my Bible in the mornings. Uh, you would hopefully see me some of the time uh, showing kindness and love to my neighbors, trying to be like Christ to them. You would see me listening to some weird anime Japanese music because that's what I do. Um, or you would see me talking in my cat voice when I'm working from home, probably throughout the day saying, hello, boy, where are you going? Which is my cat voice. And now you can never unhear that. Um, but the amazing thing is, Peter's going to put this big idea in our minds, which is, if people were to follow us around, they should be able to see signs that we are becoming more like Jesus. And uh, in keeping with his metaphor that we've seen in chapter 2 of war, do you remember that, that we talked about in chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, uh, that there are some desires that war, wage war against your soul? Um, and now he picks up that language of war again in chapter 4, um, and he says, arm yourselves. Not with a weapon, not with a gun, but with an attitude. That's really interesting, isn't it? Because if we're in the fight, then we're going to show it with the way that we live and the way that we are more like Jesus. So with that said, I'm going to pray, um, and then I'm going to read 1 Peter chapter 4 uh, very quickly, and we're going to get dive straight into it. So let me pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you that um, whatever week we've had, you have truth, hope, comfort, challenge to say to your people, and to say to those who are not yet your people, because you want to invite them in to the beautiful new life that you have for all who believe in you. But thank you, Father. We just really pray now, uh, please use your word uh, to do a mighty and good work in our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let's read 1 Peter chapter 4 together. So have your Bibles open. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also, with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body has finished with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. 
For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, detestable adultery. They are surprised that you don't join them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard uh, to the Spirit. The end of all things is near. Therefore be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is for uh, for it is time for judgment to begin with God's household, and if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful Creator and continue to do good. How are we going to manage all that uh, tonight? Um, I promise I will try and speak very quickly, um, but we're going to try and see in that passage then um, that there are a few things, okay, that this arming yourself with Christ's attitude uh, challenges us to become. But if we are doing that, it's a sign that other people are going to see that we're finished with the sin inside us. Verses 1 and 2, we're finished with the sin around us. The temptations that we see uh, that Peter talks about pagans, um, we believe in God's justice, verse 5 and 6, that we build for eternity and that we rejoice in suffering. Lots of challenging things there for us to think about. Um, so let's do that. Keep your Bibles in front of you because that will be a helpful thing to do. Now, I am realizing that I've changed a lot over the years. And one of the things uh, that I think has changed is I used to be um, a lot more of a germaphobe. And uh, particularly working with Andy Bruins has uh, just really helped me with that uh, because he will pick up on it and he will let me know. And so it's been an encouragement, brother. Thank you for that. <laughs> so in this time of lockdown, you know, the government says, don't be touching your face. I'm like, absolutely. Why would you do that? That's ludicrous. OK, um, some of you, I understand, you know, we've had this conversation uh, when you're reading a book, you put your fingers in your mouth in order to lick them and turn the page. Shudder the thought, you know, perish the thought. Anyway, use hand sanitizer. I'm like, I'm in, no problem. Don't stand too near to people. No problem, I'm in. But here's the logical implication that people had, especially at the beginning of lockdown. If you do enough of these things, if you do them well, you will be safe from harm, okay? It's just not gonna get to you. A lot of people worked on that assumption. But as I read the Bible, the interesting thing is, I realize that there's something more dangerous in here, in my heart, and in my mind, than there is out there that I can uh, get rid of. And the cool thing is, Peter is saying, this is something that is more dangerous, the sin inside you, address that as a Christian. Because it's not about um, what he's going to say, it's not about being perfect, it's not about being flawless. But it's about not giving up on loving God and having a pattern, a lifestyle, uh, a pattern of life that shows a hatred of sin and a love of God. And that's why I think I can't tell you what most school assemblies uh, or most, uh, you know, Disney and Pixar movies will tell you. I can't tell you. Follow your heart. 
Because instead, what Peter challenges you to do as you look at the passage is, verse 2, follow God's will, not your heart. If you follow God's will, you'll be finished with sin. And actually, the interesting thing is, if you unpack why you want to sin in a particular way, disobey God, you'll find that if you think hard about it long enough, you'll find that you're more satisfied obeying God in the end than you and I are in sinning. Because it's harder to say no, for example, to someone who thinks that you're attractive and wants to uh, be in a relationship with you. If you don't, it's harder to say no if you don't understand how fickle that love can be if it's just based on your beauty, outside beauty. But it's easier to say no, to be finished with sin when you have the perspective that actually God's love is better. And I mean, think about it. Think about how hard it must have been for these guys. First century Christians, they were pagans, probably, some of the people Peter was writing to, from a culture where, for example, one of the words in our passage, okay, revelry points to a celebration, uh, a celebratory procession in the name of the god, the Greek god Bacchus, um, where you can have all sorts of sexual relationships and there's a drinking parties. And you think all of the people you used to know before you were a Christian, they think that's great, and you're surrounded by them. How hard would it be to say no, or at least to remove yourself so that you can be finished with sin? How hard is it for you to say no to a mate when they're inviting you to do something which you know is just not going to be glorifying to God? And so that's really hard. And I think when I say that, when I use the words be finished with sin, which Peter uses, um, I want to be clear that there are at least two groups of people tonight that we want to talk to. In one, for some of you, when you hear be finished with sin, you hear I need to be perfect. And you want to overburden yourself with guilt and with this impossibility. And you need to hear that actually there is grace for the journey. That God isn't expecting something which he's not going to equip you to do. That we are going to feel. And Peter more than anybody knows that, doesn't he? Because he's denied Jesus. And he knows that if he can fail, anybody else can fail. But for some of us, we need to hear that we are taking sin too lightly. That we are making too many excuses not to be finished with sin. That we need to remind ourselves that loving God is better. That what we say yes to is better. And therefore, hack away with accountability and with anything else that we can so that we can arm ourselves and be finished with sin uh, inside us. But then there's another sign that we're arming ourselves, and that is that we are finished with sin around us. So look at verses 3 and 4 again. But as you do that, here's a quick question for you. Look at the screen for a second. Who do you think, this is related, I promise, has the largest number of subscribers? Do you think it's Amazon Prime Video? Do you think it's Netflix? Or do you think it's Now TV? A? B? See? Interesting. Actually, with over 160 million subscribers, Netflix uh, takes that home. Now, how about this one? How many people watch Netflix without paying? Is it 11%? Is it 41%? Or is it actually most of the people? 80%. What do you think? A? 11%? 41%? 80%? Interesting. It is 41% of people who watch Netflix, either because they're a family member and so they don't actually pay into the sharing of accounts, um, or because they uh, have a large number of email addresses and they keep getting free trials and lying about their postcodes. Anyway, there we go. How about this one? How many of us are not okay with watching sinful acts on Netflix? We would never choose, but when they come on screen, we're okay with them. We never choose to watch a movie that has them, but if we're watching something and they come on screen, we don't really mind. I'm not going to ask you because I'm being a bit cheeky. We can't quantify that so easily, but it's interesting, isn't it? We don't have the answer to that, but I think what surprises me, and what doesn't surprise me is that when you read verses three and four, that there are lots of things that if you went at a certain time of night, to the town center, you would see lots of. That doesn't surprise me. That we are capable of doing any of those things, that doesn't surprise me. Here's what surprises me. 
that I'm often happy to watch sinful behaviors on a streaming service online that represent the very sins that Christ died to rescue me from. Isn't that a crazy thought? That I'd never choose to do it. But if it's on screen, I don't really mind. I'm not really okay with sometimes being finished with sin around me. That's interesting, isn't it? And I think that's why it's important for us to realize that when we are okay with the sin around us in that way, we become desensitized. So I remember being a teenager um, and being so immersed in what I was watching that my view of love and relationships was such that you can, you know, hook up, shack up, break up, because that's just what I watch. It just washes, you know, over me. It changes my way of being. But later I learn that if I say no to watching something which my conscience is telling me, actually, this is really unhelpful for you, I remember that if I follow the God I love, the relationships that are produced out of that are much more beautiful and wholesome because they reflect the love that he's had for me. And so the core, really interesting message is that there is uh, this call for us to be finished with sin inside us and sin around us because there is a cost. And you've experienced it in your friendships, haven't you, probably? Have you not had um, actually unbelieving friends or family who don't believe as you do, don't love the Lord Jesus, and actually they don't really understand you. They don't really get you if you are a believer. If you are finished with the sin around us, they probably take the mic when you say that you believe God created the world. They might say a joke or two if you say you believe sex is precious and only for marriage. If you believe that swearing is wrong and you just won't do it. Or if you actually obey your parents and love them and honor them, they might take the mic. If you, if you have a friendship um, with anyone, a relationship, whether it's a love relationship or a friendship with someone who is not a believer, at some point, your Christianity might or will rub them up the wrong way. And we need to be prepared for that. Now, some of our lads have some really great friendships uh, in our church, and they have uh, some friends who just will mercilessly not let them even respond to the questions they're asking. You know, and actually, I want to encourage you guys and say, Carry on. Uh, be finished with sin. Be a witness. Uh, let God be your strength. Let me encourage you. Because if it's a war, then there is a cost. And it's a little bit painful on our friendship side sometimes. But part of the answer is in, as we read on Peter, remind ourselves, that's because this world isn't our home. So let's be okay with that let's text each other let's pray for each other let's encourage each other so that we can be finished with sin inside us finished with sin around us because we're not finished uh quite yet there so it's a war i want to win my friends i want to pray for them but i want to believe in justice there's a surprise there in verses five and six uh, let me ask you this what do these guys have in common Here's a throwback. Some of you know why um, there's a little uh, bottom left there. Judge Dredd, yeah? Stallone, uh, you might remember that, okay? Some of you are um, acquainted with these movies. Uh, maybe John Wick is a favorite. Maybe Liam Neeson on the top right there with uh, the movie Taken. Um, or Denzel Washington with The Equalizer, you know, The Equalizer 2. It's interesting, isn't it? I learned that there's uh, an informal category for films like this, and they are called, apparently, Man of Justice films. That's because you've got one dude who he was wronged, or someone was wronged that he loves and cares about, and he is going to exact some vengeance. Okay, he's going to pull out some toenails. Uh, he's going to, I mean, he's going to dismember somebody, shoot somebody, he's going to do something bad, but that is just. And the reason why these are high grossing movies and make a lot of money is because we love the idea of justice don't we if someone was wrong we love uh, to see them suffer some of you are more compassionate than me um we don't feel uncomfortable with it but then why is it 
that often people who would be okay with all of these movies, where justice is pretty much imperfect um, and sinful, why would they balk at the thought of a God who judges? Peter is really comfortable with that idea because God is the one who judges justly and the one to whom um, our friends who are not believers will have to give an account. And so this really puts our future as Christians in perspective and our present in perspective. Because if you're a first century Christian here and you're being persecuted and life is tough, you might be quite tempted to even envy the lives of those who are not uh, Christians. But Peter is saying here, look, there's a day coming where people are going to have to give an account and whatever happens on that day, we have believed 1 Peter 1 18 that we've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus that when we get to that day and we have to give an account we look back and we go Christ has been with me none of the stuff I was worried about truly matters now in eternity and so for many of our friends the greatest joys that they experience I think C.S. Lewis said this uh, in this life they are the closest to heaven that they will get sadly and for many um, of us the greatest suffering and pain that we experience in this life is the closest to a hellish suffering we will ever experience and so this suffering uh, uh, this judgment to come that Peter talks about should put our lives in perspective so so far we're arming ourselves with Christ's attitude we are Finished with present with uh, with sin inside us, with sin around us, we believe in justice and we build for eternity. Sorry, I didn't adjust all of the slides there, um, but imagine here for a second with me. Okay, you've got one week left, one week left to live. Yet you're fit as a fiddle. You've got a bit of money in the bank account. What do you do? Where do you go? That's when bucket lists come in. I googled a few bucket lists. Imagine here, okay? Do you know where this place is? Big hint there if you look closely enough on the screen. Imagine that one of your things that you can do is, you know, I've only got a week left. I'm going to go to all the Disneyland resorts. I'm going to visit all of them, okay? You got the money for it? Imagine. Imagine it's not COVID, okay? Imagine that you can go perhaps to the ice hotel. In Sweden, I mean that doesn't appeal to me so much because I'm I'm really not good with cold. But there we are. Um, imagine you wanted to visit a volcano, the experience of a lifetime, which apparently that percentage of people um, only have a chance to experience something like that. But imagine uh, if none of these things appeal to you, having dinner on a hot air balloon, okay, over the Loire Valley in France. Would that be Would that be something? Whatever you say you would do if you only had a week to live and the resources, here's probably what whatever you thought didn't involve. Whatever you were thinking probably didn't involve this. I'm going to go out on a limb here. It didn't involve blessing and serving someone else. Certainly for me, some of you might be more kind hearted than me. You know, one week left to live. None of us probably said, you know what? I'm going to focus on enjoying my prayer life, my communion with God. I'm going to make sure that people know I don't hold any sin or grudge against them. I'm going to make sure um, that I see who's free and who needs encouragement and who needs for me to speak kind words to them. And I'm going to do that. That's what Peter is going to say. That's weird, isn't it? Verse 7, the end of all things is near. And then he gives us a load of ways to respond to if that is true. That's the controversial thing. When, when we are experiencing a tough time, what do we do? We turn in on ourselves and we isolate. That's our uh, nature that God slowly wants to change and to sanctify. But when we are more like him, when we hear Jesus could return at any time, we go, let's build for eternity then. Now more than ever. Because you know what? Verse 10. I'm just a steward. I'm a steward of God's grace. 
I have some gifts, I have some abilities, I have some money, I have some possessions. I'm going to put them to the use of others and bless them. I'm going to use um, this uh, self-control, this uh, clear-mindedness, sober-mindedness, um, to, as I enjoy my relationship with God, as I pray, to love others deeply, to practice hospitality. And there's much more that we could say, but we don't have time. But let me just say one thing on loving each other deeply, for example. How many of us, um, when we wonder what it means to love someone, um, are a little bit unnerved by Peter's uh, subordinate clause there um, in that verse? Do you love like this? Imagine this, okay? Do you love like this? Honey, why do you always do this? Why are you always doing this? Do you love like this? Um, this is just like the time when you did fill in the blank with some grievance that you have in your friendship or in your marriage. You never change. I don't hold a grudge. I just never want to talk to so-and-so ever again. It's interesting, isn't it? Are we people who um, ask God for help so that we will have the love that covers a multitude of sins? Because when I find it hard to forgive or to let go of a grudge, I want to ask myself, this love asks uh, itself, is what other people did to me, how does that compare with what I've done against God? And how did he treat me? That very quickly clarifies my need to love with a love that covers a multitude of sins. Now, just to say, of course, as we add a little caveat here, a love that covers a multitude of sins does not mean abuse. It does not mean staying in an abusive relationship. Um, so that's a very different thing. But Peter is saying here, and I think that's controversial, to a group of suffering Christians in a tough spot, he's saying, in your, in your tough spot, in your suffering, serve others, think of others, pray for others. That is a huge challenge for me. And so is this. Rejoice in suffering. Our last one. Because, you know, sometimes you're going to struggle as a Christian. And it's kind of your fault, right? It wasn't really because you were a Christian. I remember my time at school. I became a Christian when I was 15. And um, throughout that time at school, you know, I had friends who did all sorts of things, all sorts of things. So I had a friend who would set off uh, smelly bombs in the air conditioning unit in Brazil, which Brazil is hot, right? <laughs> that is not nice. Uh, and nobody would know who did it. Uh, I'm not giving you any ideas, by the way. I mean, our youth are nice. They would never do that. But um, anyway, they get in trouble for that. They get in trouble for um, setting off fireworks um, in the men's or in the ladies, for smoking in school property, for messing about and shouting inside the classroom while the teacher is teaching. And they get in trouble for that. Throwing things at other people. How many of you teenagers watching have witnessed this throwing of things at other people? You have, because it's, it's, it's just human nature, isn't it? And the list goes on. All of these things are our fault. But Peter isn't talking about when we've mucked up um, and we see the consequences of our own sins. What about when it's not our fault and still we are in a tough time? Now, as I say, I became a Christian when I was 15. I had two really, really close friends that I admired, looked up to. Um, together, I think we were almost every teacher's nightmare. Almost. OK, the three of us. And I cared so much about these guys. But when I became a Christian, all of a sudden my, my priorities changed. Um, I didn't want to be OK with, for example, looking at porn. I didn't uh, wasn't OK anymore with um, going to. So we had one of our friends. Uh, his parents were completely irresponsible. Um, they would just let him drink and, uh, and uh, go into their liquor cabinet. Um, and we would go, right, we're going to his house. Um, and when I stopped wanting to do that, all of a sudden our friendship just wasn't the same. There wasn't the same, hey, I care about you, I want to hang out with you. So I kind of lost those friends because we were now living different lives. That was hard. That was the good side 
because we had some friends who would make fun of us, even some teachers. That's not nice. But Peter is talking to people who are suffering much worse. And yet, if you look at the, the verses there, uh, eight, um, verse 12 and onwards, he says, guys, please don't be surprised when this happens. Expect it. That's part of your life. This is the testing, remember chapter 1, the testing of your faith that makes your faith like gold because it brings you closer and closer to God. It's a sign, actually, that you really are living for God if these things are happening. Verse 13, it's worth it because of this. One day, you're going to see the Lord Jesus and he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. You've honored me. And so we can be overjoyed. OK, and I think secretly you and I are OK with thinking about the future and letting that change the now, because, you know, if you're like me, um, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a big kid, which is kind of why I'm a youth leader and a children's worker. So when I know a game is coming out, I save up. OK, um, so something future, if I can't buy it right now or my wife won't let me, I will save up. OK, if you guys study for a test, you set aside time for that, and you're okay with not seeing your friends as much because it's a worthy goal. Some of us um, don't eat junk food and we exercise. That doesn't feel nice, <laughs> exercising often, but we go, you know what? The goal is in sight. Uh, my health is worth more than what I lose. Similarly, the only reason why Christians rejoice in suffering is because of what Peter is saying uh, about the glory of Christ. We remind ourselves that now his love, his comfort, his presence is better than anything else that we give up. That's the only way that we can wage war on our sin, on the sin around us, that we can believe in God's justice, that we build for eternity, that we rejoice in suffering. It's if we know what we are really saying yes to every step of the way. That's why verse 19, as we finish, we can commit ourselves. And you've seen, I think, in, uh, sorry, I didn't write down the verse, uh, but you've seen Peter say before, we entrust ourselves to him who judges justly. It's almost as if we're saying, okay, I'm struggling to be finished with sin. I'm struggling to arm myself with Christ's attitude. Let me remind myself. Verse 19, you're a faithful God. You created me and you created the circumstances I'm in right now. Please help me. You created me to continue to do good. Show me how I want to honor you. That is a prayer that God honors. Definitely. So I'm going to pray now um, and finish our time together. Uh, and in a moment, uh, Ruth is going to tell me whether you've been texting her madly um, because you want to go into breakup groups uh, to relax uh, and catch up with each other. Uh, and if not, that means you will um, terminate your meeting on your own device. Uh, and we're going to have uh, time as a youth group uh, with us youth and youth leaders. So let's pray together. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much that actually we need to be reminded that um, what we're saying yes to when we deny ourselves is just so good. Holy Spirit of God, we pray that even as we sit um, uh, on the, in the comfort of our homes right now, you would remind us of how precious your presence is, how precious your comfort, your word when you speak to us really is, and that tomorrow when we are tempted to be angry for the wrong reason, when we are tempted to rely on an idol um, for the love that only you can give, that we would be able to tomorrow preach to ourselves and say, no, no, what you have in Christ is better. Therefore, love the Lord, hate sin. Help us, please. In Jesus' name. Amen.